Chucking Reamer, Chucking Reamer, Chucking Reamer, Chucking Reamer, Chucking Reamer, Stubby Reamer. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. This is part three of the Pennsylvania A3 Switcher locomotive build. Today, we're going to finish the bulkheads that divide up the sections of the boiler. We've got a lot of intricate little parts to do and a whole bunch of silver soldering and machining to make these bulkheads complete. So let's go. Last time we hammer formed all of the main boiler sections. And so this is the front tube sheet and we need a whole bunch of holes in all these parts now. So I'm gonna start with the tube sheet here and I've got my wiggler in there. This is the pointy end of a lot of edge finders. If you're wondering what it's for, this is what it's for. There's still a very light punch mark in the center of that that was used for various setups until now. And it's gonna be useful once again to get me centered up on the tube sheet so that I can position all of the various holes that are needed here. There's some mounting studs for the smoke box and there's a couple of steam ports for the blower pipe and various other accessories at the front of the engine. You might notice that I'm doing all of this drilling and machining dry on the copper, not using any cutting oil. And that's advice I got from a model engineering article. The idea is to keep from contaminating the copper with any chemicals that might interfere with silver soldering. That turns out to be very bad advice as you'll see here later in this video. And of course, all these holes need reaming, and well, as is always the problem with small mills like this, standard chucking reamers are often too long. Now, I've got my setup here and I don't want to disturb it, and I don't have a collet that this reamer will fit in, so I'm going to go ahead and take the dramatic step of cutting the shank short on this reamer. Now, I'm very, very loath to do this, and people always ask me why I don't just do this. The reason is that there's a center at the back of a reamer that was used to grind that reamer. And if you ever need to regrind that reamer, then you need that center, and if you lose it, it's gone forever. So that's why I really resist doing this. However, this is really a crucial moment here, and I don't have a lot of other choice. I can't wait to order a stubby reamer in this size, and also it's a very cheap import reamer that I really don't care about, and it's not a common size that I use a lot, so I just made the decision to cut it short so that I could keep moving forward here. If I need a longer reamer in this size, then I'll buy a higher quality one anyway, so here we go. Luckily for all the other reamers on this particular job, I had collets that would fit, so I didn't have to cut anything short. The most interesting holes on the tube sheet are, of course, for the tubes, hence the name. So these I drilled up in a series of stages to the largest drill that I have, which is half inch, but the tubes are three quarter, so to bring them up to final size, I'm gonna use my head, my boring head, that is. Now, Kozo suggests in the book to do this on the lathe, and that is a perfectly reasonable way to do it. The actual cutting operation would be much faster on the lathe because boring heads are kind of tedious. You have to stop and adjust the dimension after every single cut, which takes a fair bit of time. However, the setup on the mill is much, much quicker because on the lathe, you have to do this on the faceplate and there's a lot of tapping around and trying to dial it in and get it centered and so on. So I think it's a toss up which method is overall quicker. I decided to do it on the mill because I felt that would be easier and I was more able to get an accurate position and dimension on all these tube holes. I think the main reason that Kozo does it on the lathe is just because one of the nice things about his books is that he doesn't assume you have a lot of tooling. He assumes a pretty basic hobby machine shop. So for example, he does not assume you have a rotary table. So you saw me using mine for making these hardwood formers in the last video, but Kozo actually demonstrates a method for doing that without the rotary table involving a hand-built wooden structure with a long lever arm. I did it on the rotary table because I happen to have one, and I'm doing this with my boring head because I happen to have one. But again, Kozo assumes a very simple set of machine tooling, so that's a nice thing about his books, and don't think that you're going to have to invest thousands and thousands of dollars in tooling to build his engines. Dimensionally, the goal with all of the machining on these boiler parts is the same, and that is we're trying to hit a two to four thousandths gap between all of the parts that are going to fit together, because that's an ideal gap for silver soldering. You need them to be not too tight and not too loose, and that is very, very important. A lot of people asked me in previous videos in this series why I was taking so much care to make these parts accurately, because, you know, boiler parts are all hammer formed and you're kind of hammering everything together in the end anyway. And I think that's misguided because the number one thing that you're trying to do with boiler making is maximize the odds of success of the silver soldering at the end, because that is where all failed boiler attempts fail. It's the silver soldering. Nobody fails at building a boiler because they weren't able to machine some part. Boiler builds fail because the silver soldering at the end fails. So everything that we're doing here is to make the silver soldering as easy as possible. 
Next, the front tube sheet gets some reinforcing ribs, so I'm laying out where those need to go. Because Kozo's design here for the boiler has only three tubes and they're located at the bottom, that means the top half of the tube sheet is largely unsupported. The tubes act as stays for the bottom half of the tube sheet. You always want to avoid flat surfaces in boilers because flat surfaces can't withstand pressure very well. So without any tubes in the top half of the tube sheet, we need some kind of reinforcement up there. And that's what I presume these ribs are for. Now the fitting of them is a little bit tricky. You need to file a compound curve into the end of each part so that it can fit up against the flanges and the curved inner surface there. Once I was happy with the fit of the ribs there, I needed to machine them down to width. The bar stock that I made the rib from is about twice as thick as the final ribs need to be. So I just machined them down to final thickness here. Okay, final fit up here. Just make sure this rib is going to go in the right place. You can see the compound curves that I had to file on both ends, and that was just a lot of trial and error to do that. That fit is looking pretty good. I've got a little bit of a large gap at one end, but otherwise it's good. It's centered on my scribe line, which is going to be very important here in a moment. It's reasonably flush with both flanges, so I'm pretty happy with this fit. Now the next thing I do is I drill a clearance hole for a fixturing screw right on my scribe line there. And that's why it's important that the rib fit on the center of that line because otherwise it would be difficult to align these holes here that we're going to need to make. And then that is a 164 brass screw, a very tiny brass screw that Kozo suggests using for fixturing these. So then I get to drill a very tiny matching hole that I transfer punched from the clearance hole and then tap that 164 in the rib. It doesn't really matter where on the length of the rib this is, it's just to hold it in place for silver soldering because a tall skinny part like this is very difficult to keep from moving while you silver solder it. Next, everything goes in the pickle bath in preparation for silver soldering. This is Sparex number two pickling acid that I use. It's great stuff. It's much milder than sulfuric acid, but works just as fast. And everything has to be pickled. So that's the tube sheet, the rib, and that tiny brass screw. Everything has to get pickled and fluxed that you're going to silver solder. So I rinse everything off in clean water, and then I can get the parts fluxed and ready to go here. It's crucial that flux is on every mating surface and, once again, on the screw and in the screw hole. The silver solder needs to flow all around all of these parts, or it could be a leak. These fixturing screws may just be temporary for assembly, but they are also sources of leaks, so you really have to be careful. And don't be stingy with the flux. A lot of people are stingy with flux because there's a persistent myth that silver solder follows the flux while you're silver soldering. It's not really true. The silver solder chases the heat. The flux, however, restricts where the silver solder can go because it won't stick to any surface that isn't chemically clean. Next, I cut and place little pieces of silver solder along the joint. This is the by the book Kozo silver soldering method, incidentally, and I found it to work extremely well, much better than any other technique I've seen. So I do strongly recommend reading his article, The Art of Silver Soldering, which is included in the back of the A3 Switcher book. It's as close to foolproof as I've seen silver soldering get, so strong recommend. As you can see here, I'm heating the back of the joint, just like other forms of soldering or brazing. It's critical that the joint is what melts the solder, not the torch. The torch is just there to get the joint hot, so heating the back side of the joint is the safest way to make sure that that's what happens. Once that silver solder starts to flow, I tend to wash the torch all around the part as well, just to make sure that it flows everywhere that it needs to go, because once again, the silver solder chases the heat. So you want to make sure the heat is everywhere that you might need silver solder to end up. There's my final joint. I'm pretty happy with that. I got really good fillets and coverage everywhere, except on that one gap that was a little bit big. I got a good fillet on the back of it, but could be a little better on the far side. I got solder flowing all the way through the brass screw though, which is very good. That means that won't leak. So looking good. I'll touch up that one joint a little bit later on here, but so far so good. There's two other rib sections that get made the same way. And you might notice, hey, I'm using all kinds of cutting fluid now. And well, that's because while making these other two ribs, I shattered two, yes, two number 53 drills. And you can see one of them broken off in one of my ribs there. So I got to make that rib twice because I could not get that piece of drill out of there. The two things that cause small drills to break, especially in copper, are running them too slowly and not using enough cutting fluid. 
In my case, my mill doesn't really run fast enough for drills this small, and I was cutting them dry, so really asking for trouble. So I went back to using cutting fluid, and honestly, the pickling acid cleans it up just fine anyway, so don't be shy with the cutting fluid on copper. I used WD-40, and it works great. There's the other two ribs soldered in. That went pretty well. You can see I've got some joints there where I don't have as much solder as I would like. I'm missing some fillets there, and the little piece got a little crooked there, but that's okay. And I got good flow through the backs of the fixturing screws again, which uh, those get filed off now. And after doing that, I decided I wasn't quite happy with those joints, so I went back in and added some more solder to them. At this stage, you really got to be 100% confident in every joint because it's only going to get harder from here. Regarding those brass screws, brass is technically a no-no on boilers because live steam will leach the zinc out of it and make it brittle. So everything on a boiler has to be bronze or copper. Kozo specifically specifies brass screws for this, I think because A, you can't get tiny bronze screws, and B, because the way he uses them when you're done, they're totally isolated from the steam. They're either completely inside other copper parts, or they're completely surrounded by silver solder. So I think that's why it's okay here. Next step is to machine the outside of the tube sheet to final dimension, which I'm going to do on the lathe. So for this, Kozo suggests reusing the hammer form backer, which I'm doing here. I used a gauge pin to dial in the center of it there. This doesn't actually matter, I just dialed it in roughly because what really matters is that the piece that we're going to attach to this is dialed in. The easiest way to do that, of course, is just to wood screw the piece in place. So I just marked three decent places for some wood screws, and I pre-drilled those and then screwed the tube sheet to the front of it. Again, this is all straight out of Kozo's book. I'm not making up any of these setups here. He has excellent ideas for this, and I see no reason to deviate from them for the most part. Now the part has been hammer formed, so it's not especially round, so the task here is just to get it dialed in as best you can. I think I got it to within 10 or 15 thousandths, which is close enough, as long as the final part is going to machine down to dimension without cutting too much off any one side. And to that end, I'm measuring the diameter in a few places here just to see what the smallest diameter is. I want to make sure that from that diameter, I'm going to have enough material that I can remove to hit the final dimension. That looks like it's running reasonably true, the copper that is, not the wooden form behind it, which doesn't matter. And now I can start machining. For machining copper, generally you want to use the same top rake on your tools as steel, and in fact comparable speeds and feeds. You might think it would be more like aluminum or brass, but the books say you're supposed to machine it like steel, so that's what I'm doing, and it does seem to work very well. An interesting footnote here, all of the curved surfaces of these hammer formed parts need machining, but the straight surfaces do not. And that's because the straight surfaces maintain their dimension when you hammer form them, because they're only bending in one axis. However, these curved parts, they get quite a bit thicker after the hammer forming, because you're piling up all of that material into a smaller space. So all the curved surfaces end up oversized when you're done, but the straight surfaces don't. You'll see more of that here in a minute. Once I've got that on dimension, then I decided to go ahead and face those ribs a little bit. The hammer formed flange is not perfectly uniform in its thickness or depth, if you will, so my bars were kind of sticking up a little bit more than I wanted. With the ghostly magic of power crossfeed, I went ahead and faced those down a little bit. I kind of split the difference. They stick up a little bit on one side and they're flush on the other side, but they're no longer sticking up everywhere like they were. I don't want to machine this flange perfectly flat because A, there's no point to doing that, and B, it's just going to remove material that you might want for a stronger joint. This joint is going to be forever inside the boiler, so there's really no point in squaring it up and costing yourself valuable material there. That's the machining done on the front tube sheet. Next we need to start making the accessories that get attached to all of these bulkheads. First up are the smoke box studs. These are made from bronze, just like everything that is attached to the boiler surface needs to be. You can't use brass for this stuff because of course brass dezincifies and gets brittle under prolonged contact with live steam. These are very simple parts. They're just turned to dimension and there's a blind threaded hole in the center of them that is used to mount the smoke box to the front of the locomotive. One of the things about a boiler is that it's not just a functional part, it's also a structural part. Pretty much everything on a locomotive attaches to the boiler. It's considered part of the frame. So this is a good example of that, which is slightly annoying as a model builder because all of these attachment points are potential leaks in the boiler, unfortunately. Now, Kozo has done a lot to minimize the amount of things that attach to and go through the boiler to make it easier for final silver soldering, but some stuff like these smoke box studs are kind of unavoidable. 
After turning and tapping from the front, I use my grooving tool to create the narrower diameter at the back, which actually fits into the boiler shell. And then I use the grooving tool to part it off at the same time since I'm here. So there's one stud after some deburring. A second one was made the same way. Then of course these parts get silver soldered into two of those holes that we drilled in the tube sheet. Everything gets fluxed and I used some scrap to kind of hold the part level there so that the stud will end up square when I'm done. Once again some little pieces of silver solder on the top of the joint and I heat the joint from below. These are very simple parts so it's pretty easy to get a nice joint there. There's the two studs. I got a nice fillet of silver solder around both sides of both parts there. That went really, really well. So once again, I'm 100% confident in those joints. If you're not 100% confident in any joint, once again at this stage, you have to do it again. Because later on, many of these joints will be inaccessible from the back as the boiler gets more and more assembled, and it will become nearly impossible to fix them. The next part is a really interesting one. It's the fire door ring. Remember that the back of the firebox is a double walled box essentially with water in the center and the fire door ring is like a little tunnel through the water in the boiler that lets you get access to the fire inside that double walled box. So this is made from a long copper strip that I've machined to dimension and we're going to roll it into a ring. Again I'm following the way Kozo says to do it here and I learned a lot in the process. That strip needs to be rolled into a ring, and I do actually have a slip roll, but this ring is a little bit too small for it. So I decided to turn a mandrel for it on the lathe out of a scrap of aluminum, and I'm gonna use it to hammer form the ring into shape. I'm making this mandrel the exact inner diameter of the final ring, and also the exact width. You'll see why in a moment. And I undercut the base there so that the copper can sit square against that shoulder. Annealed copper has virtually no spring back, so you don't have to make the mandrel smaller than the final diameter that you want. I annealed that strip and I'm clamping it into place on my mandrel here, and I'm just gonna hammer it into form. And away we go. This actually went really, really well. I'm pretty pleased with that. Once again, all that time watching Ron Covell has paid off because this went exactly as planned. And this is the kind of job that a couple of years ago, I honestly would have had no idea how to do. But a little bit of knowledge can go a long way and can also make you dangerous and annoying. As I go here, I'm also tapping it against the shoulder to keep it square. And then when I get right to the end here, we'll see if my joint closes up. And it almost did, but I ran out of anneal there. The part had started to harden up. So I went ahead and annealed it one more time. And then I was able to get that curve tighter by working from the far side of the joint towards the joint and just tapping it up against my mandrel as I work around. And again, there's virtually no spring back in annealed copper, so it just molds to that mandrel like butter, and that joint closes up nice and tight. That worked really, really well. That mandrel is going to pay for itself a few more times yet. One such place is here on the mill. I'm going to use it to hold the part horizontally because there's a tiny little strap that gets riveted over this joint here to hold it closed. So I'm going to do that on my mandrel here. I'm going to clamp the ring to it and then I cut and machined to dimension this little strap here and then I'm going to clamp that in place centered on the ring and then I can hammer that over into shape there. So you can see how this fire door is made. It's a ring that has a tiny little riveted strap across the top of it. Then from this position, I can drill the rivet holes straight through on both matching parts here. When that well strikes aluminum, I know I'm through. Then I can use a rivet to hold one end of it there and move over to the other side and do the same thing. Now this is a lot of fiddly little work for what's really just a ring. And there's certainly an argument to be made that you could just machine this out of a solid piece of bronze. I'm not sure why Kozo opted to make this out of sheet metal like this, but again, I've decided to follow his method as much as possible, and I'm learning a lot of new skills doing it, and that's really what counts. Oh, and did I mention I broke another drill doing this? Yeah, I still decided to try and cut something dry. After everything I've been through, you'd think I would learn. Well, mark it on your calendar. Never again will Queen Dunkey cut copper dry. Luckily, in this case, I was able to just pull the strap off and I could fish the broken drill out of there. No harm done. But boy, sometimes the universe warns you over and over and over. And if you don't listen, well, whose fault is that? Quick safety note. You can't really see it on film, but when that drill shattered, two, yes, two pieces of it flew directly into my safety glasses. That's right, kids. 
you think you're too awesome for PPE, well, you're not welcome in my shop. Well, I mean, unless you bring poutine, then maybe, but stay away from the tools. The attachment now is a little tricky because this is simultaneously riveting and silver soldering. So the ring, the strap, and both rivets get pickled, and then all those parts get fluxed, and then the parts get squished together, which needed a little encouragement because of the angles of the rivets. Then I peen those rivets over. There's a countersink in the top of that strap so that the rivet has somewhere to expand into in case that wasn't clear. I also filed a flat spot on that mandrel to act as the anvil for that riveting. And then a little more flux just for good measure. And then finally the silver solder. So it's a bit messy because you have to do the riveting while everything's covered in flux. And I used my small torch to heat that joint from the back and applied the solder and Bob's your uncle. But okay, this seems fine, right? But do you ever get that feeling that a part that you've made is fine, but it's not, not as good as you wanted it to be and you know you can do better? This joint is a little messy and I know one of my rivets wasn't great. It still fits on the mandrel, so it's round, but I don't know, it was just bugging me. I wasn't super happy with this. After sleeping on it, I went ahead and gave up another afternoon and I made it again. Now, luckily making it again went much, much quicker because I already had the mandrel made and I knew how to do it. And this I'm much, much happier with. I got nice clean solder joints all the way around the strap, through the joint. The joint is tighter. The rivets look better. The rivets have solder through them as well. So overall, I'm more confident in this structure and it looks a lot better. It looks much more like I think Kozo intends it to. So that was worth making it again, I think. So sometimes it's worth just making something again, even though the first one was fine, possibly for your pride and possibly so your boiler doesn't explode. The rest of the boiler bulkhead parts are pretty comparable to what we just did on the tube sheet. I'll show you some highlights here. I did a lot of aligning things on center lines as I'm doing with the back head here using again the wiggler there. There's a scribe line that you probably can't see on camera and I'm just getting that aligned. You can't really use the sides of the part for reference because they're hammer formed so they're really rough. And again these parts don't have to be perfect at this stage. They're going to get machined and fitted later anyway but it doesn't hurt to do as good as we can here. And you'll note that I'm always drilling these holes extra deep into the wood underneath so that there's clearance for the reamer and or the boring head as needed for each of these holes. The most exciting hole here is the fire door hole. That's where that fire door ring we just made goes. I drill this out as large as I can, which unfortunately is not very large. I don't have very big drills here. And then after that, I got to go to the boring head. And this took a while because again, you got to do fairly light cuts because it's copper and boring heads aren't very rigid. And this is a very large hole, but a little perseverance and some help from podcasts to pass the time and the job got done. My target for this dimension is just slightly smaller than the fire door ring, because of course this ring is hammer formed, so it's not perfectly round. So what I'm doing is stopping when the ring feels like it just about wants to start going in there. And that's about where that is right now. If you just go until the ring fits, it's going to be too loose in some areas because the ring isn't completely round. After that initial cut and a lot of deburring, then I do some handwork to fit the fire door ring. So you can offer it up and you can kind of see where it's hitting on the ring. You can hold it up to the light as well to help with that. And then you can file this or I'm actually just using a straight bladed deburring tool because copper carves just like butter. So it's really easy to just shave the areas that are tight until you get a good fit. This is a very iterative process and you have to be patient with it because you don't want to get a loose fit anywhere or the silver solder won't be able to fill the gap. Silver solder is very bad at filling gaps. But once I've got a nice even slip fit in there, then we're done. And that went quite well. It's supposed to stick through the back head a little bit and then bridge the gap to the firebox sheet on the other side. Just like the tube sheet, the curved sections of the back head need to be machined. And that's where the former that we made before comes back into service. I countersunk some bolts in the top of it there so I can just bolt it directly to my rotary table. And then a single wood screw is enough to hold that down. And once again, I can machine this to dimension quite easily here. As I did when I made the formers, I just calculated the stopping angles for this rotary operation by sketching it out in CAD, which for me is much quicker and less error prone than doing the math and trying to calculate it that way. This is the stage where accuracy on making those formers really pays off. If those formers aren't really accurately made, like two vernier caliper accuracy, 
then that machining isn't going to go well. You're not going to be able to machine it two dimension because there's really only enough material there for a light finishing cut. So if the hammer form isn't pretty accurate, then that step isn't going to work right. The fire door hole in the firebox sheet was made the same way. And now we can use those two holes and the fire door ring itself to align the two parts because the stay bolts on the two parts have to be very well aligned. So the easiest way to do that is to align them with the ring and then match drill them. Again, this is straight from Kozo's suggested order of operations. Stay bolts are connecting structures between parallel flat surfaces on a boiler. Again, anywhere that there's a flat surface has to be really well supported because flat surfaces are bad for pressure vessels. One of the tricky things about Kozo's boiler drawing here is that it's not always easy to find the dimensions that you need. They're kind of scattered around. So for the hardware for the fire door here, the hinge and the catch, I couldn't actually figure out how tall they're supposed to be. I was kind of able to deduce it from some other drawings elsewhere in the book, but uh, it was a little bit of a guesswork here. So the hinge bracket is next. I cut and machined a piece to dimension for that. I left it overly long because it's got two bends in it. So I'm putting the bends in the middle and then I'll machine them to length afterwards. Using my shiny new sheet metal machine here for this bending, that worked really well. Then I machined a little block of aluminum, the exact distance between those two tabs, which gave them the support so I could clamp it in the vise and machine those tabs down to final length. By putting both bends in the middle of the piece, then you don't have to try and figure out how much material is consumed by the bend, which in sheet metal work can be pretty complicated. Then that little block served double duty to support the part for cross drilling the hinge holes as well. For the bottom hole, I used the top hole as a guide just to make sure that they remain aligned rather than trying to drill all the way through the aluminum, which would have been difficult and prone to mistakes with a tiny drill like this. It's hard to overstate how small some of these parts are. You guys tend to see them zoomed in on the camera, but some of these parts are very, very small. Like this entire hinge is smaller than my thumbnail. The final step is to round the ends there with a file. These little hinge parts are another hybrid of rivets and silver solder, so more messy fluxed riveting. If you're wondering why some parts are riveted, it's because silver solder is very strong in shear, but not as strong in tension. So it's good practice for any part like these where the pressure is behind them and tending to push them away from the joint to rivet those to give them mechanical strength in tension. So you're not just relying on the silver solder for that. Now, for parts this tiny, honestly, silver solder is probably fine. It's very, very strong, but it's good practice, so never hurts. And once again, Kozo knows a whole lot more about building boilers and locomotives than I do, so I'm certainly not going to deviate from his plans here on details like this. Once again, that gets silver soldered and pickled, and there's the final joints there. Again, those look pretty good. I'm reasonably happy with that. I did actually go back and add a little bit more solder to one of the hinge joints and to one of the bushings. Again, just trying to make really sure at this stage that all these joints are perfect. Now those stay bolt holes that I mentioned earlier get tapped. For this, I just tap them by hand using a tap and guide block to keep them square. This is a block I made many years ago that's just squared up steel and I add holes to it as I need for more and more tap sizes. And the firebox sheets get made using all the same methods you've previously seen. And then once again, they get trued up on the rotary table. Here you can really see that effect I was talking about, how the curve just naturally peters out into nothing on the side. Because the curved part of the flange was quite a bit over thickness, but the straight sides are not because they don't get thicker when you hammer form them. So if you did your hammer forming well and your hammer forms were accurately made, then everything will machine nicely back down to the size that it's supposed to be afterwards. Now it's time to silver solder the fire door ring onto the firebox back sheet there. This is pretty exciting. This is by far the most complex joint I've done so far. Once again, strictly using the Kozo method here, I've got my flux and my silver solder placed, and I'm using a stainless steel fluxed scratch rod, which is also part of the Kozo method helps wrangle the solder into position there. And you'll see the stages of the flux here. First, the water boils off, then you get that white powder, and then the powder starts to melt, and the powder turns into kind of a foam. And this is the moment where all the parts start floating around and moving, so if you don't have good fixturing, now is when you'll find out. In my case, I've machined a block the exact thickness of the exposed section of fire door ring for the far side of the part there to hold everything square. Then once that foam gets a little hotter, then it starts to melt and the foam melts down into a clear liquid that looks just like water, and that's the moment where the silver solder is just about to flow. So the flux tells you what's happening. 
The trick is you should get to this point in under five minutes, preferably two or three minutes. If it takes you longer than that to get the part hot enough to melt the solder, then the flux will have spoiled. You can also use the black flux, which lasts a little longer and gives you more leeway here. I'm using the white flux for these smaller joints because I have a lot of it and I want to use it up. So there's the foam melted down there and you can see that it's just about to turn into water and you can see the silver solder starting to get soft there and there's the magic right there. The silver solder started to flow on the front joint there where the heater's closer to it and this is where the scratch rod really comes in. You can use it to move the molten solder around and make sure that the entire joint gets good coverage. Now this setup makes it more difficult for me to access the back of the joint, so I'm swinging the torch around and I'm kind of aiming it down low. Again, always heating the back of the joint, not the top. The torch has to heat the metal, not the solder. And then again, using that scratch rod to just push that molten solder around, make sure everything gets good coverage. When I think I'm done, I very quickly grab the part and flip it over and inspect the joint because it's still hot enough right now that you can make corrections if you need to. You can add a little more solder, a little more flux, and touch up the joint if needed. But I've got a really good looking fillet there, so I think I'm good. So set that down, let it cool off a little bit, and then pickle it once again. Once it's pickled and cleaned up, then we can really inspect the joint, and I'm very, very pleased with that. I got a really nice fillet all the way around. Some flooding on the back there because I used a little bit too much solder as I tend to do, but I'd rather have too much and a little bit of flooding than have a bad joint. And I'll need to do a little bit of filing there to make clearance for the back head. The only thing that went wrong here is the ring got a scooch crooked as you can see there. I thought I was really careful setting that up, but it did move a little bit during soldering. The good news is though it did not affect the fit, so I don't have to make any changes there. The ring still fits nicely into the back head. You can see how that's going to form the double wall of the back of the boiler there once that's all soldered together. And the firebox is supposed to stick down further. If you're wondering, that's not an error there. So looking good so far. That's really good progress, I think, on some tricky parts. Next is the stay bolts that go between a bunch of these layers here. So I made up seven of these from bronze. They're just little studs that have a little bit of a thread on one end that helps fixture them for silver soldering. I'll just make sure that everything fits together still with all those in place and kind of see how those act to reinforce the flat surfaces there by joining the double walls together. It's a very traditional boiler making method. So now those all fit and now I can silver solder them in place. With that done, I'll check one more time that everything still fits. Make sure that nothing moved while silver soldering. I made sure to get silver solder flowing down through the threads on those studs, otherwise they will likely leak. Here's a mock-up of how all the sheets or bulkheads, if you like, fit together roughly with standard metric ducky for scale. The firebox crown sheet will enclose the firebox there, and then the barrel will of course go right there, joining the throat plate to the front tube sheet, and then the back head is joined to the barrel with an outer sheet. And then here's the fireman's view, if you like, straight down the fire hole there. Someday I look forward to having this view. A quick epilogue, lest you think that went flawlessly. Take a look at the drawing, and take a look at my back head. Do you notice anything? Yeah. I actually mirrored all of the holes on this part because I drilled them from the back, but of course the drawing is showing the back head from the front. I didn't notice this until very late in the manufacture of that part. Luckily all of the holes except two of them are symmetrical, so it didn't actually matter very much unless those two holes were going to be a problem. I dug deeper into the design of the engine and luckily it is not going to be a problem. This hole here is the water gauge, so it really doesn't matter which side that's on. And the other hole here is the blower pipe, and this goes straight through the entire boiler to a matching hole on the front tube sheet, and there's a pipe that connects this to the wet header at the top. The holes in the front tube sheet are symmetrical as well, so they can be flipped, and the other hole in the front tube sheet connects to the steam dome with an angled pipe, so that pipe can simply angle the other way. So no harm done, I flipped two of the features on this boiler, but that was a close one. My heart skipped a beat when I realized that mistake. Well, this is a big milestone for the boiler. With all the sheets done, from here out, we're really just connecting all these pieces together to form the boiler. So it's going to get pretty exciting pretty quickly here. I hope you've enjoyed watching this process. Thank you so much to my patrons who make all of this content possible, and I will see you next time.